Good morning, Northern Colorado. We are thrilled to have you join us here on Zoom as we get started with our townhouse breakfast hosted by Spirit Crossing Clubhouse, the Ark of Larimer County and Foothills Gateway. I'm Ann Hutchison. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Fort Collins Area Chamber and I'm honored to be your MC today. A few housekeeping items. Closed captioning is available. Um, so if you're on your, your desktop, you should be able to see the, the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom controls. You can click that to turn on your subtitles. If you're on a smartphone, the caption should just pop up automatically. Do feel free to share questions with our panelists in the chat box that will be live during our entire conversation. And if you're um, calling in only, and so you're not here on joining us on video, you can certainly email questions to events at foothillsgateway.org. So it's my tremendous pleasure to introduce all of our uh, panelists today. We're gonna mix this up a little bit. I'm gonna run through, introduce everyone who's joined us. And then um, we will focus our questions to Congressional District 2. Uh, we know that Congressman Nagoose has another commitment that he needs to jump off for, so we'll make sure to get that. Um, two questions asked of those panelists first, and then we'll jump back around to our entire grouping. So joining us today, we do have um, candidates in Congressional District 2. We've got uh, Congressman Joe Nagoose, we also then have Charles Wynn. In the district attorney race for the 8th Judicial District, we have Gordon McLaughlin and Mitch Murray. For State Representative District 53, we have Jenny Arndt. For State Representative District 52, we have Kathy Kipp. For State Representative District 49, we have Michael Lynch. And we have Yara Zoki. Then for Larimer County Commissioner District 3, we have Jody Shattuck McNally. And then for Larimer County Commissioner District 2, we have Kristen Stevens and Bob McCluskey. So um, I want to offer again our thanks to all of our candidates for joining us this morning, as well as for our attendees. Um, we're excited to focus on the topic of health and human services for individuals navigating mental health challenges, as well as those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Just to set some ground rules, um, we'll ask that each candidate address the questions that have been provided ahead of, ahead of time to them. They'll have a two minute limit per question and the timer above my head will be our official clock today. So we'll invite our candidates to keep an eye on that as they um, go through their answers. And um, again, we'll have two minutes per candidate per question. So um, let's jump right to it. As I mentioned, uh, the Congressman has another appointment this morning that he has to go to. So we wanna make sure to um, focus on District 2 to, to start. And so I'll throw out the very first question. Again, these have been provided to our candidates ahead of time. Um, what have you done to reach out and hear concerns from constituents living with disabilities, mental illness, and addiction? And again, we'll start with you, Congressman, and then we'll go over to Charles. Well, good morning. Thank you so much, Anne, for the question and for hosting us uh, this morning. I uh, always enjoy this breakfast. I wish we were, of course, gathering in person, but nonetheless, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to join you virtually. Uh, my name is Joe Nagoose, honored to represent Larimer County and the 2nd Congressional District in the U.S. House. Uh, and I've been grateful to work uh, for the opportunity, rather, to work closely with the ARC of Larimer County uh, throughout my first term and to have an opportunity to hear from teachers, students, community leaders about uh, the impacts of mental illness and addiction in our communities. Uh, you know, the most important part of my job as a representative is ac accurately reflecting the views uh, and the priorities of uh, the community that I'm so blessed to represent. And that takes a lot of listening, and we've done a lot of that. We've uh, held over 40 town halls, more than the entire congressional delegation here in Colorado combined. And uh, many of those town halls included hearing from constituents living with disabilities, uh, mental illnesses, and 
addiction. Uh, just to give a couple of examples of the work that we've tried to do with respect to these particular public policy issues, early on in my tenure, we introduced legislation to fully fund the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act at the full 40% level, uh, very important for the Pooter School District Thompson uh, School District to support our students with disabilities uh, fully access educational opportunities. Uh, during the preparations process, I also had the opportunity to actually meet with some middle schoolers uh, in uh, Laporte uh, for their Disability Day of Action to discuss their support for that program and how it impacts uh, their schools and their classmates. So just one example. And then in addition, uh, a bill that we introduced uh, Allies Act, bipartisan legislation uh, that would ensure private insurance companies provide coverage for specialized hearing devices. And that was actually a bill that came to us from a constituent of mine. Uh, her, her name is Allie, she's an 11-year-old in Broomfield who needed these devices. And so very uh, you know, pleased that we could ultimately work with her and her family to introduce this legislation and hopefully get it across the finish line. So looking forward to continuing our work ahead if given the opportunity to serve our community. Thank you, Congressman. We'll now have uh, Charles Wynn answer the same question. What have you done to reach out and hear concerns from constituents <clears throat> living with disabilities, mental illness, and addiction? Well, I'm a physician and I've been working with a lot of these issues for a long time. I can tell you back in 1968, as a medical student, we spent time in what were called homes. It turned out that many of the, many of the people with disabilities were actually put aside put out of sight, out of mind. We needed to change that. We've seen that we've changed it over the years as a country. We've gone from just churches supplying and help, giving help to these, these homes to actually Americans with Disabilities Act, recognizing that we as a people need to take responsibility for making sure that people with disabilities can get back into society. They should not be isolated and kept aside. Mental health, of course, is another huge problem. In the past, once again, we've tried to isolate those who have these disabilities. We need more continuity of care. And this, of course, has to be done on the local level. Yes, it's nice to have federal programs, but all care is delivered locally. I will also tell you that my son is a counselor for those with addiction, particularly young people. He first worked here in Denver, but then he was out assigned to Atlanta and now has opened another facility in Tampa Bay. These are very, very difficult issues, need continuity of care. The programs we put together have to be developed locally with federal support. You don't deliver care from Washington, but how do we have the continuity of care down here? What kind of support we have? It's not always a matter of just funding. It's a matter of how we fund, that we understand the problems and that we work to protect these people who have these disabilities, these affirmities, give them the care that they need, let them back, get back into society and have as, most, as a fulfilling life as they can with these disabilities. I thank you. Thank you, Charles. So our second question, again, we'll start with the Congressman. Um, what do you view as your role and the role of your office in ensuring the human rights of people living with intellectual and developmental disabilities and behavioral health conditions are protected? Well, so that, it's a very important question, Anne, and I think core to uh, my service and the service of anyone who you know, is uh, fortunate enough and honored enough to serve in the United States Congress. I, one of my most sacred obligations as an elected representative, in my view, again, is to be a voice and, and an advocate for our community and whether that's passing legislation that improves people's everyday lives, having my office help manage some very sometimes challenging bureaucracies, the Social Security Administration, uh, and many other agencies, federal agencies, so that citizens can get the support they need, or whether it's simply shining a spotlight onto a matter that needs more attention from the media, the public, uh, or my colleagues in Congress. Uh, people living in, with intellectual and developmental disabilities uh, and behavioral health conditions should I think as Ark of Larimer states so well and articulates this, be able to live the lives that they choose. And we're able to assist in that process by ensuring access to support services, education and training, uh, healthcare and long-term support services. We have an incredible constituent team uh, in Fort Collins at our district office there that work each and every day uh, helping folks in the community. And then of course, I've been proud to support legislation in Washington that prevents discrimination, for example, towards people with disabilities in housing and ensuring 
fair access to the vote. I also would just would be remiss if I didn't note the realities of this pandemic, of course, that we're living in. And we know that during this pandemic, uh, caregivers and support systems have been so adversely impacted. Um, I've been proud to advocate for specific coronavirus relief for seniors and people with disabilities. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, no matter our backgrounds or our challenges, we all share the same hope that we'll have equal opportunity and that the system will treat us fairly and justly. And it's a priority of mine uh, to ensure that everyone's human rights are respected and protected under the law. And, and I'll continue uh, to do that uh, as long as uh, I have the, the honor of uh, serving the second congressional district in Congress. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now offer the same question to Charles. Could you, could you uh, state that question again? Absolutely. So what do you view as your role and the role of your office in ensuring the human rights of people living with intellectual and, dis and developmental disabilities or behavioral health conditions? Lisa, uh, as I've said before, and I certainly agree with the Congressman, we all have to be involved in this. We all have to see and care for those who can't care for themselves. They're all levels of disabilities. And we know it must be tailored to each of those. We can't have a one size fits all program. As I've seen many of these people dealing with the issues, we know we must figure out what they particularly need. We must become, as your organization says, advocates for those who can't care for themselves. We have a wide range of disabilities. We have a wide range of psychological problems. And we certainly have difficult difficulties with addiction. How we come about and do this, of course, must be done on a local level. I see my role in the federal, at the federal level is making sure that we communicate with those on the local level, making sure that they have the help and the assets that they need. These programs must be continuous. Continuity of care is tantamount to coming up with the treatments that these young people need. I say young people because, again, I spend a lot of time with my son talking about the programs they have for young addicts. But we have all ages that we must deal with, all kind of issues that we must come up with. Those with physical disabilities need to be able to get out of their homes. We know over the years with the ADA, we provided access to buildings and transportation. We must make sure that those with psychological problems are able to integrate as much as possible into society. And those, unfortunately, with addiction, we must provide them the worth the resources they need. It's not a one pill solution. It's continuity of care. Those are the kind of programs we must put together to provide those with disabilities a chance to get out and enjoy life as much as possible. Thank you, Charles. Um, because we, uh, we've had, because the Congressman has to leave us at, and we want to be fair to both of you, uh, what we'd like to do is just give you each one minute for a closing statement, anything you'd like to share with our audience today. And then again, we'll jump back to the starting questions with the rest of our candidates. Congressman, a minute for any other, other comments you might have? Sure. Uh, well, again, Anne, I just want to say thank you to you and, and to the Arc of Larimer County for hosting uh, this very informational event. It is always an important one every election cycle. And uh, while we all wish we could be together uh, drinking coffee, <laughs> enjoying breakfast, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to have this exchange of views with uh, Dr. Wynn and, of course, with all the, the local candidates running up and down the ballot. Uh, look, we've accomplished a lot together in our first two years in Congress, whether it's introducing more legislation than any freshman lawmaker in the country or having more bills signed into law by this president uh, than any member of Colorado's House delegation. Uh, but uh, most importantly, above all else, we did it together by listening, uh, by trying to find common ground, by holding a record number of town halls and engaging uh, here locally with the community. And if given the opportunity to represent our incredible community in the United States Congress, I'll, I'll continue to do precisely that. There are so many challenges that we face as a country, as a state, and as a community, but I have every expectation and belief that we're up to the task, and uh, I believe that we'll be able to ultimately overcome those challenges, again, working together. So I thank you for the opportunity and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you very much. Charles? Yes, I appreciate all the work that the Congressman has done and all the bills that have been introduced. 
But these are difficult issues. These issues really must be, have be focused. The legislation we come up with must understand the problem. We need to study this problem. We have studied it. It isn't just a matter of coming up with funding. It's often a matter of how we use that funding. I can assure you there will never be enough funding. So let's use it and use it wisely by looking at these issues, studying those issues. These three issues you've brought up, disabilities, psychological problems, and addiction are extremely complex, difficult issues. They, they tear at the core of who we are as, huma as humans. Let's figure out the solu solution. Let's come up with a solution, but again, it must be a solution that's delivered locally, not from the federal, not just from the federal level. Excellent. Thank you both so much for joining us again. We appreciate you making the time. And um, now we're going to open it up for our other candidates to join us in the conversation. Here, we'll start with one question and we'll work our way around the room. I'll announce who's the next person to speak. Again, we'll have two minutes on the timer for people to share their comments and their thoughts. Um, I'll start out again with our first question, which is, what have you done to reach out and hear concerns from constituents living with disabilities, mental illness, and addiction? And to start us off, we'll start with our district attorney race in the 8th Judicial District, and we'll give the microphone over to Gordon. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, thanks so much, Ann, and everyone else for the ARC and everyone for having us uh, to talk about these important issues. I really appreciate it. And thanks to so many attendees who joined us early in the morning and, and are paying attention to these races. So it's, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Gordon McLaughlin. I'm running for district attorney in the 8th Judicial District, which is both all of Larimer County, as well as our neighbors up in Jackson County. Uh, I would be the first Democrat to ever hold this office, and I'm looking uh, forward to bringing a lot of positive change here to Larimer County. Uh, my wife Jessica and I live here in Fort Collins, uh, and as a former deputy district attorney, um, you know I've certainly experienced, um, you know, folks with disabilities, mental health issues, addiction um, coming into the criminal justice system, and often they're repeat players in the criminal justice system, and and we need to do a much better job of providing folks with the resources that that they need. Um, one of the main reasons I'm running for this office is because I think there's been a significant lack of outreach from the folks currently in charge to a lot of marginalized communities. Um, you know, the, the communities I named to start with, but, you know, every community has its own needs um, for resources and for treatment, whether that's communities with disabilities, whether that's BIPOC communities, um, everyone has their own needs and needs resources. You know, I just sat down a couple weeks ago with a parolee here in, um, in the 8th Judicial District um, who had struggled with homelessness and struggled with addiction and had spent years trying to overcome those things and had, had committed several crimes and he was very honest and open about that and, and paid his penance but um, got in the right program and was able to overcome that addiction and was able to contribute to the community. He's here working now. Um, in the middle of our conversation, he got up to donate to a charity that some of the other folks in the treatment program were, were participating in. Um, so there are great success stories, um, but we need to make sure that, you know, not only are we um, uh, prosecute the, the, the tough cases, but we also have the compassion to deal with folks that have other needs in our community and that we're, we're doing both of those in the interest of justice. Thank you very much, Gordon. We'll now offer the same question to Mitch Murray. Thank you very much for hosting this and, and allowing us to take part. I appreciate that. As I said, when I first signed on, you know, I, I'm really here because I want to listen. I want to hear what the concerns are and what the needs are of the constituents. I've been with the district attorney's office now for 30 years. Uh, I've prosecuted about any kind of a criminal case you can imagine, but I started in county court. And when I was in county court, I had the opportunity to work with folks from Foothills Gateway, uh, dealing with people that had intellectual and developmental disabilities, both as victims in cases and as people that were charged. And it was a great partnership trying to figure out the best way to move forward and improve people's lives uh, to help out everyone that was involved. Uh, that continued uh, when I was chief of county court. We would have meetings and discussions about the best way 
uh, to approach those cases to help people get connected with whatever kind of counseling uh, or services they needed and encourage them to take part, uh, to take responsibility for their actions. And it was a, it was a very fulfilling and, and rewarding. And, and I think it caused us to have to think a little bit differently about how we approach our criminal prosecutions. I've also had the opportunity to work with many in the drug treatment uh, and mental health field, trying to figure out how best to address the concerns that they have for their clients, for the people they're working with. You know, in reality, we haven't sat down and met directly with the constituents. I can't tell you that I've come sit down with the people who are being served by Foothills Gateway or even sitting down at uh, Summit Stone, something like that. And I think that'd be very useful. Uh, most of my contact has been in the nature of working with folks that are serving and assisting that community. And I think uh, hearing from them, uh, being willing to learn how to adjust what we do to better serve uh, that community is vitally important. And I wanna continue to do that. One of the things I was able to do uh, when I was uh, the sex assault prosecutor here in this jurisdiction many years ago is prosecute a case in which a young woman was a victim who had uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. And we had to take the time to meet with her and to uh, do a better job of communicating, uh, meeting her where she's at, uh, letting her know what's gonna happen, trying to build trust so that she could come in and talk about what was a very painful experience for her. And we were able to do that. And, and uh, she was able to take the stand, she was able to tell her story and we were able to get some justice uh, for what had occurred to her. Um, I look forward to continuing to work with uh, all of the folks involved in this breakfast meeting. Uh, I appreciate being here and uh, <clears throat> am ready to listen. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mitch. Uh, so, so now we're going to switch over. Same question, uh, but we'll move on to State Representative Jenny Arndt. Jenny. Okay, thank you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. This is my favorite event of the year because I get back in my comfort zone. Um, as you know, I was a lifelong special educator starting in the Peace Corps and then moving back in K through 12 and then eventually higher ed training um, teachers to be special ed teachers. And uh, I'm happy to say I've taken a part time job back with that um, university to mentor doctoral students <clears throat> who want to go into the field of special disability. So I'm very excited. I kind of get a little professional. Um, comfort zone each day now. Um, what have I done to reach out? Um, you know, uh, I think I'm in constant contact with our Spirit Cross and we go to the dinner every year. Mm -hmm. Foothills Gateway knows how to get in touch with me. I used to be on the Commission of Disabilities before I ran for office. And I'm also in touch with the special ed teaching community here. In fact, um, I just got an email yesterday that the Blue Book is on audio. So I sent that out to um, the special ed teachers yesterday and said, hey, you know, just in case. And they're like, oh, okay, great. So they can uh, disseminate that. And then I just forwarded it to Carrie too. I just remember, I was like, I should send that to Carrie. So I think I'm pretty in touch. I mean, I can always be in better touch. We tried to do a bill um, for people hard of hearing last year uh, that just didn't get off the ground because of the pandemic. Uh, but um, in terms of having them have access to prescription readers every time they get a prescription. Oh, I'm sorry, limited sight. <laughs> um, so that they would have an a e-reader for every prescription. You just put it on the pad and it reads it to you. You can imagine that if you don't have. Um, so that could be helpful. They have it in Nevada. We we're trying to mimic that program here, along with my colleague, Mary Young from Greeley. Um, that's what I do to be available. I think that was the question. So. Um, I'm right here, um, and you can always, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, we will now switch over to State Representative from District 52, Kathy Kipp. Hi, thank you so much, everybody, for having me here this morning. Um, you know, I really um, am a huge fan of, of our three hosting organizations today. Um, Arc of Larimer County, Foothills Gateway, and Spirit Crossing. Um, I've had an opportunity to visit each of these organizations. Um, when I was on the school board, um, which I did for seven years before I joined the legislature two years ago, um, you know, we had fabulous, fabulous programs to help our um, kids out with disabilities. We had um, Cooper Home and Community Connections and Project Search. And, you know, I really did spend a lot of time trying 
to uh, make sure that I was um, staying in touch with, with the, those communities because you know, those are some of our kids with the biggest challenges. Um, as um, somebody mentioned earlier, um, IDEA funding, you know, that was one of the things as an advocate on the school board that I, legis that I advocated for at the federal level was to fully fund IDEA because that would um, help all of the funding to all of our schools so much. I still advocate for that as a member of the state legislature now. Um, but really appreciate, um, you know, our Ken Foothills Gateway and Spirit Crossing and that when you guys come down to the Capitol, you take the time to say hi. Um, I appreciate being able to visit you. Also, as, um, as a state representative, I take that word representative very seriously um, with my, um, you know, co-folks here in Larimer County um, or I happen here in Fort Collins. I'm Senator Janal and Representative Art. I do spend a lot of time holding town halls and issue forums. And um, in addition, this year, I've done a lot of what we call, well, like driveway hours and Zoom hours or what I call them. So trying to make um, ourselves very much available and have had the opportunity to reach out some additional folks for that. Um, so really just you know, we're always available by email and by telephone too, but I will get to some more policy stuff in the next question. My time is up. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, we'll now switch over to our candidates running for state representative in District 49. I'll repeat the question because it's been a little bit since we heard it. So let me share it <laughs> again with you. Uh, what have you done to reach out and hear concerns from constituents living with disabilities mental illness and addiction. And we'll start with um, Michael Lynch. Thank you, Ann, for hosting this uh, today. This is, uh, this is fresh on my mind. I just um, spent yesterday morning meeting with uh, the lobbyists at Frontline going over these issues and, and some of the bills that, uh, that are potentially gonna come up uh, this, next, this next session. So it's, it's, this is fresh on my mind, so this is good, good timing. Um, <clears throat> You know, as a business owner, I actually have uh, an unofficial program where I, I hire people uh, that are um, having a hard time getting a job because of addiction issues. And we kind of put them through, once again, an unofficial program, unsponsored by the government. Un, uh, it, it's, it's just a, a personal mission of mine to work with people that, that, uh, that, that have some of these issues. We've got about a 50% graduation rate. I'm, I'm happy to tell the story about a, a narcotics uh, felon who was a serious <laughs> drug dealer that came to us um, and just couldn't get a job anywhere else. So we, we put him to work and, and helped him out and, and, and got him back on the road. And then he came to me the other day. And he also, he lost like 100 pounds. I mean, the guy really got his life together. He's one of our best success stories. Um, and it was really neat to, to, to be part of that process. Uh, the, the, other, the other experience with other employees I've got is, is work with the Oxford House program, which, uh, which is a, you know, kind of a nice uh, gateway, if you will, from the, the detoxing process that, that we fund here in this state and getting people back on their feet. Um, so th these issues are near and dear to me. And I, I mean, I think, I think the more we can address, um, address the issues of addiction and, and mental uh, illness, the, the better off we're, we're gonna be in the state. And I look forward to doing that and, and started that conversation yesterday and, and look forward to continuing it as, uh, as we move forward. So thank you so much, Ann. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we'll offer the same question now to Yara. Hi everyone. Thank you so much to the groups for putting on this wonderful event. Wish we could do it in person, but I appreciate um, putting this together virtually and for allowing me to be here with you. My name is Yara. I'm running for State House in District 49. I am a first generation Iranian American. I am a tax attorney and a mom to two little boys. My campaign is centered around people. And I think a lot of times politics becomes more about being responsive to giant donors and to corporations. So I'm 100% grassroots funded and I reject that, reject that money. Um, and in doing so, I have to meet with, with my voters and get to listen. M most of the time what I'm doing is listening. And so I've pre-pandemic held a lot of events to hear from people and, and post-pandemic we're getting a bit more creative with how we do that. But I want everyone to know that I am accessible. 
And whenever I'm having these conversations, issues of mental health always come up. It touches so many lives, in particular in Larimer County. Um, one thing we ask a lot of times is who knows somebody who has or currently is suffering from substance abuse disorder? And I know Gordon's done this as well. Um, and a lot of times, most of the time, every hand or close to every hand is up. So these are issues that we are discussing uh, every day, every time we meet with voters. Before I knew um, I wanted to be an attorney, I studied psychology and I worked on autism research. I became very close to the families with autistic children and would hear their concerns. And what I would hear repeatedly is issues with access to service and concerns about cost. And these families are sacrificing so much of themselves and doing everything in their power, wearing themselves thin to give their family members the best shot at success. And I don't think that cost should be our barrier. Um, so that is something I hope to work on. Thank you so much, Yara. Appreciate that. We'll now move over to um, our candidate that's able to join us today for Larimer County Commissioner District 3, and that's Jody Shattuck McNally. Go ahead, Jody. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity this morning. I'm Jody Shattuck McNally, running for County Commissioner District 3. Thank you to the Arc of Larimer County Hoodles Gate, Gateway uh, Spirit Crossing of Summit Stone for organizing this event today. I have attended this breakfast in the past uh, four years every year, and this is uh, a bummer we can't be together today, but I always enjoy the conversations. Um, things that I've done over the last um, few years um, is also in, in, um, along with what I have done with my family members, because I have um, some family members who have intellectual and physical disabilities. And I have been in um, that family, married into that family for 30 years. So we have been advocates and working on getting them the resources here in Colorado to help them live the full life. And I wanted to show this kind of cool poster. Well, it's a cool poster my nephew sent me that he does out um, with his disabilities and it shows all the um, resources every month of what he's doing and, and around the count, um, around his life and it's pretty exciting. Um, over the last, in 2018, I helped pass the mental health initiative on the team. We ran all over the county talking to folks about the need for increased resources for behavioral health services and mental health service services. Really proud of that work. And while we did that, I talked to agencies organizations, nonprofits, and individuals. And just like Yara and Gordon had said, whenever I gave a presentation, pretty much everyone raised their hand in the room who said their life was impacted by behavioral and mental health issues. Um, I serve on the Human Services Commission for Loveland, and I've done a lot of work helping um, with that community, getting grants and resources and advocating for those resources. I also volunteer the last few years with Loveland Connect, which works on homeless folks who are dealing with addiction and problems, helping them get resources, one-on-one uh, -on -one navigation. Um, it's a really important issue, and I always able to listen. I've toured Foothills Gateway, and I'm always accessible and wanting to learn more and see how I can support. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Uh, we'll now jump to the candidates joining us from the race in Larimer County Commissioner District 2, and we'll start off with Kristen Stevens. Thank you, Anne, and thank you um, for having us this morning. And sorry, this has to be virtual, but um, it's the next best thing to be in person. Um, my name is Kristen Stevens. I'm running for Larimer County Commissioner in District 2, and I currently serve as a Fort Collins City Council member. I've tried to um, make outreach a priority during my time on council. So I hold regular listening sessions, and I've always held those in places that are accessible um, by bus and places that are accessible where people don't have to buy coffee to be able to talk to me. So because I want to have these um, open conversations with all members of the community. Um, I've also held special listening sessions um, at uh, uh, affordable housing centers, but also had a special listening session at Red Tail Ponds. And for those of you who don't know Red Tail Ponds, it's a um, it's a low income housing uh, facility that has both um, help for people with behavioral health issues and addiction issues. And so I had a specialist listening session there about a year ago to hear from the residents about how they're doing. They're residents, they're my constituents, and, and I want to hear from them. Um, similarly, I've, I've uh, spent time at the ARC um, talking to um, people who are served by the ARC to see what needs they have. 
So I've been um, trying to do outreach uh, amongst all these groups. I, I work closely with um, the Alliance for Suicide Prevention and have attended uh, a lot of their programming and talked to people with lived experience. So it's really important for me to hear from all my constituents. It's something I would continue as a county commissioner. Um, I've also worked with our uh, city's commission on disabilities um, on a lot of transportation issues and accessibility issues that we can really fix. So I believe that, um, you know, I believe that local government can help work on these issues and we need to work in tandem with the federal government to get these dollars into our community um, to help folks who are, who are um, needing, needing help um, with, with these issues. And so I, I would love to continue that work on the county level. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, we'll now go to Bob McCluskey. Great. Thank you, Ann, uh, and thank you for putting on this event this morning. I'm Bob McCluskey. I'm a candidate for Larimer County Commissioner, District 2. I grew up in Fort Collins, went through the school system here, graduated from Fort Collins High School, went on to get a graduate degree and came back and worked in the family business, Poudre Valley Creamery and Loveland City Dairy down in Loveland. During that time, I was active in the community. Uh, I was on the board of the Rotary Club, uh, chair of the Pooter Fire Authority, chair of the Parks and Recreation Board, uh, chair of the um, Community Foundation Board, and the regional board for El Pomar. What that gave me was an opportunity for people to come to me when I was on city council if they had issues. So the access they knew they had because they knew me was very great around Fort Collins and Larimer County. In the city, as we'd have issues come up, uh, the city staff was very large and was very helpful in responding to issues. As I was elected to the state legislature twice, we all know the staff down there is very small. Sometimes it was one person, but we tried to respond to all those questions that came up because people knew they could get to us and we would respond or help them in the same way as our question later on we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, when I ran for that uh, last time for the legislature, uh, we reached out and had a meeting in every precinct that we walked, which was every precinct in the district. So people know that I've done a lot of outreach in the past. I've continued to do that at the city, at the state. I know how to put together that and reach out to people. I think these days, because there is so much outreach, we need to focus on more effective outreach to make sure people are involved so the decisions are best reflective of Larimer County. As we grow, the county is very diverse. We need to be able to capture that when we ask for input from people. I'm Bob McCluskey, Larimer County Commissioner candidate. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, and then we've got one final panelist to share her thoughts and I apologize. Somehow she fell off my script, but I'm happy to have her back on. Um, and that's uh, Senator Joanne Janal representing State Senate, Dis State Senate District 14. So Senator, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Anne. Um, thanks to ARC and Spirit Crossing and Foothills Gateway and everybody that's on this morning. Um, I am Senator Joanne Janal and I am running uh, for re-election for Senate District 14, which encompasses uh, uh, for Collins, all of Fort Collins. Um, this issue, uh, dealing and, and working with people and persons with disabilities is, is very personal to me because my former partner and I raised her son uh, from the age of seven to 17. And he is a wonderful, sweet young man with intellectual disabilities. And I see him to this day, and he has taught me so much about life and what matters in life. And that was uh, definitely a blessing that I had this uh, uh, honor of uh, being able to live part of my life uh, with him. But in my last, in my eight years in the Colorado legislature, I've always made myself available to one-on-one -on -one meetings with constituents um, and, uh, town halls as well as coffees. Just recently we had a town hall on the update on um, what is going on with behavioral health in Larimer County, uh, seeing if there's any upticks uh, because of COVID and there certainly have been uh, with behavioral and mental health issues. Um, I've also attended and uh, continue to visit Spirit Crossing 
uh, clubhouse. They have a graduation every year, which uh, I'm sorry they didn't get to have that this uh, past uh, spring, but that's a wonderful opportunity to, to see how uh, folks uh, have graduated and what they're doing and going to do. Um, and also, uh, I go visit respite care and other, uh, other daycare facilities. Um, I work closely with Summit Stone uh, to help find out and find the right pathways for people, especially during COVID, that needed to get medication, that needed to get mental health uh, help. And uh, so it's been really a, a great opportunity to work in this time to be able to help folks. Also to be able to get help for uh, uh, parents that need to uh, take care and, and get uh, help, uh, financial help with the Family Cares Act uh, that they can stay with their son instead of uh, losing, if they lost their job, they would be able to care for their son and get paid for it. This has happened several times during COVID. So happy to help in regards to that. Um, also, I worked a lot with Lori Stolen in regards to the new mental health and addiction facility and um, have done a lot in the courts, uh, sitting in on drug courts um, for teens and their families, ride-alongs with EMTs and our police. And um, I'm very impressed with uh, the mental health issues and the people with addictions that they have to deal with and how they deal with it. So um, I think I will leave the other comments uh, on uh, the other passions I have with, uh, you know, people dealing and living with disabilities for the next question. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. So uh, we're going to transition to our second question. Again, as an audience, you've heard this before, but let me go ahead and share it and then we'll start back up at the top of our list. Um, and the question for all of our candidates is, what do you view as your role and the role of your office in ensuring the human rights of people living with intellectual and developmental disabilities or behavioral health conditions? So again, we'll start back up to, at the top with our district attorney candidates and um, we'll flip it around and we'll have Mitch Murray go first. Um, thank you. Uh, you know, the role of the district attorney is to uh, prosecute state law violations in our, in our state courts. Uh, we are to seek justice uh, in those prosecutions, making sure that the rights of everyone are upheld. That is the rights of the defendant and the rights of the victim in the case. To seek a resolution that addresses the criminal conduct that takes place, both in the punishment aspect and in the aspect of rehabilitation. And I think our role when it comes to the populations that you're describing here, whether that's someone with intellectual and developmental disabilities, whether it's addictions, uh, substance abuse problems, mental health uh, issues, mm -hmm. is the same. We need to make sure those people's rights are respected. And sometimes, as I said earlier, that requires taking a little bit more time, getting some training on how to address communication issues. Uh, having our victim witness division, and, and uh, I'm very proud of the victim witness division we have in the district attorney's office. They do a great job trying to help victims navigate their way through a scary and confusing system, but have them uh, learn how to communicate better, how to address specific issues of the different populations that we have to deal with, and trying to make sure that their rights are upheld, that they do have their chance for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, just like everybody else. They need to be respected and treated in a way that fulfills those rights and enables them to have their place in the criminal justice system and, and in our society uh, to the greatest degree possible. One other thing that I was able to do, and I think our roles are different. We have the role in the courtroom, but we also have this wider societal role. I was able to attend a workshop in November on expanding your talent pool that was offered by the ARC uh, in coordination with, I think, Foothills Gateway, Easter Seals, um, and uh, the Larimer Workforce about bringing people, adding diversity to your workplace, expanding your talent pool, and improving everybody's lives and the knowledge and experience they have in our community. And I look forward to being able to pursue that uh, when elected district attorney. 
So please vote Mitch Murray for district attorney. There's my campaign plug. And I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to check out for a moment. I have a court appearance uh, and then I'll be coming back. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mitch. Uh, we'll now turn it over to Gordon McLaughlin to answer the same question. Thanks. Well, it, the role of the district attorney is to seek justice, and we need to expand the vision of what that means beyond law and order and punishment um, to, to look at the health and safety long term of our community. Um, you know, Joe Nagus at the top of this mentioned that in two years he's held 40 town halls. Um, I think these things start with conversations to understand where people are coming from and what their experiences are. And the district attorney's office in eight years has held zero town halls. Um, that's one of the major reasons I decided to run is, is to have these conversations. Um, I don't think social justice needs to be at odds with criminal justice as it historically has been. The district attorney has an incredible amount of power in the criminal justice system. They uh, have the sole decision making over charging. Um, they have the largest say in sentencing, um, who's, who's going to prison and jail, and who's getting treatment and resources. And so we need to use that power wisely. Um, we need to create a culture where um, folks understand um, these different communities and, and what resources they need. Um, a culture where folks understand um, addiction and treatment and rehabilitation, uh, that they understand um, folks with disabilities and not just in sentencing and, and resources on the back end, but in how folks with disabilities and other challenges, um, how that might affect their interactions with law enforcement in the first place, um, how that might inter uh, affect their um, workings in the community and their interactions with the district attorney's office. And then I think we need to advocate for these things. Um, you know, Jody Shadignally mentioned a minute ago, um, the Behavioral Health Initiative in 2018. Um, that was an incredibly important initiative for this community's health and safety. Again, not just social justice, but criminal justice. And the district attorney's office um, was totally silent on that bill um, because they see those things as separate buckets. Uh, I'm looking forward to doing the work um, the holistic work um, that really looks at the health and safety of this community in a new way. Excellent. Thank you very much, Gordon. We appreciate those comments. Um, so we'll get back in the correct order and we'll jump up to, uh, again, our state senator for District 14, Joanne Janal. Same question. Thank you. I wasn't expecting to get on so soon. Um, my role as a senator um, is to uh, help to protect uh, persons living with disabilities and uh, with uh, behavioral health and addiction issues. I've sponsored many bills in, in the last eight years uh, to protect people living with uh, these uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, I am a voice for the people that don't have one. I've, I've been passionate about this, uh, starting with employment first uh, for persons with disabilities, uh, running that in 2016, and again, to um, uh, support it and engage more businesses in 2018. Uh, this helps get our disabilities, uh, uh, persons living with disabilities uh, into the workforce. Uh, if they can work, but just like anybody else, they should be earning the same pay and they should be, uh, be able to get a job uh, the same way anyone else can. Um, I also ran a bill that um, uh, just last year uh, in, 2019, in, in 2019 uh, that protects the unlawful abandonment and abuse and confinement of people with uh, uh, disabilities and cognitive disabilities. And, um, this is uh, extremely important because more and more people, and I think um, our, uh, our folks running uh, for the uh, district attorney's office uh, can relate to this, that there is more abuse going on and um, that needs to be, I have zero tolerance for this and it needs to be something that we have higher fines and, and laws for. So that was a protection I put in. Uh, with Senate, Senate Bill uh, 19172, and also protecting people this year with disabilities from uh, financial um, uh, uh, issues, not to the best of their interest, uh, being able to protect people who don't have a voice from uh, guardians 
or family members who may want to take advantage of them financially. And I will continue to make sure that, that uh, people with living with disabilities have a voice at the Capitol. Um, lastly, uh, I want to continue to reduce the cost of prescription drugs and the availability of medical help for, for um, everyone, uh, whether they have uh, developmental disabilities, addictions, or behavioral health issues. Uh, there needs to be parity with mental health, and I ran a bill for that last year so that people with behavioral health issues are treated the same way by their insurance companies as they are with physical health issues. So um, I see my time is up. I thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we'll now move over to State Representative in District 53, Jenny Arndt. Go ahead, Jenny. Hi, thank you. So I believe the question is, what is my role now? in um, protecting and defending the human rights. Um, so as a state uh, representative, well, um, I just believe that inclusive communities are strong communities. And I've always fought for inclusive classrooms when I was a teacher as well. And it's not just for the person who has a disability, it's for the entire community to live together as one and realistic functioning, uh, connected, cohesive communities. So that's the first thing. The second thing about human rights I do uh, is the right to free and, uh, free and appropriate public education. If that's a federal law, I take that very, very seriously. And we need to defend that whenever we can. And um, sometimes I've seen that slip a little bit. So uh, last year, uh, myself and three others, and of course, with the majority vote of the um, Capitol and the signature of the governor, we repealed the death penalty, which it, um, disproportionately impacted people with disabilities. The last person that was um, killed in the state of Colorado had an extremely low IQ. And um, we just, that was a, a heinous policy and I'm glad that it's gone. I also tried to run a police bill that failed. The police came to me and wanted to be allowed to have custody through an evaluation process for people suffering, um, suffering a mental breakdown or in a severe addiction issue. Um, um, I still think that's the right thing to do. Our police came to me and wanted to have continuous custody and not just legally have to drop them at the door of the hospital, which I think is not um, a humane thing to do. I also ran an amendment on a big education funding bill that clarified that everyone at public money should go to the public and the schools that um, take public money need to serve the public. And that means they have to have an equal um, admission policy for um, the, any, any student who wants to go can go or have an equal shot at the lottery. I firmly believe that public money goes to public and that is a very inclusive notion of the public. It's not just the schools with the highest test scores who are trying to maintain that. Then you can also block some things, which I did, uh, just stop them before they're even introduced. Uh, one former majority leader uh, on the Democratic side thought it was a good idea to uh, go around parent, parental rights in the IEP process to save school districts money. And I just blocked that before it was even introduced. Finally, we can worry about our funding with the lower student count this year that will disproportionately impact our people with special needs. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, we'll now jump over to State Representative District 52, Kathy Kipp, same question. Hi, um, well, thank you again, that's a great question. So, you know, I think the question is what, what can we do? What should we do? Well, everything we can. So um, when I first joined the um, State House, the woman who sits a few seats down for me on the floor is the mother of um, a child with autism. And she said, hey, you wanna run this bill on special education with me? And that was actually my first bill that I was um, a co-sponsor of that got through the house. So I was very excited about that. Um, you know, I think that one of the big disappointments of this year that we were really planning to get through was a bill to permanently buy down the IDD wait list. What the plan was is that we were going to be investing $20 million a year um, for the next five years. So 20, then 40, then 60 up to $100 million a year after five years to get rid of that IDDE wait list, which is truly a humanitarian issue at this point. It's not okay that people have to wait for those services. Um, one of the things, when that, because we didn't end up with any money, we ended, it was going to happen and then it didn't. Um, still on the list. We have not forgotten. Um, a couple of other things that we did do this year, well, one of the things we did do this year, which I think is really huge, is telehealth. 
telehealth especially helps to de-stigmatize um, mental health. It makes it a lot easier for people to get to appointments. It, it helps people overcome the barriers to seek a lot of the treatment. And, um, you know, just, I, I, I was talking to a mom who has a child with um, cerebral palsy just the other day, and she was saying, you know, we're really having this issue and if we um, did something in state law, I think that we might be able to overcome that. So, you know, anytime I hear something like that, I want to look into it more. I want to know, well, let's learn more about this issue. Is changing the law really the best way to address it or should we be addressing it in some other way? So, you know, when you have issues or problems, please do come to and talk to us about it because we take everything very seriously. Thank you very much, Kathy. Um, before I repeat the question again for our, our additional candidates, I do want to remind our guests that if you've got questions, you can throw those into the chat box or the Q&A. Our, um, our team from the ARC and Foothills and, and Summit Crossing are, are keeping an eye on those and we'll probably have time for maybe one of those questions. So go ahead and keep submitting those if, if you've got a moment. Again, our question right now that we're working on with our candidates is, what do you view as your role and the role of your office in ensuring the human rights of people living with intellectual and developmental disabilities or behavioral health conditions? And we'll move over to our candidates in State House uh, District number 49. We'll flip it around and we'll have Yara go first. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's a really important question, so I appreciate it. Um, about the role of my office, um, if elected, I think the role of government generally is to help people, and in particular to look out for our most vulnerable groups. I think that that is a difference in philosophy um, between a lot of people running, and I think that it is crucial that we elect people who share that vision, that the role of government is to help people. I think our healthcare system generally needs a lot of work. I think one big problem we have is that we separate out different types of healthcare into these separate buckets and they all have their own unique hurdles, whether it's dental care, eye care, or mental health. Um, I don't think that we need to be looking at these as separate things. And the reason we've done that is to derive larger profits for these huge industries and, and not really thinking about people. So our healthcare system generally, I think needs to be reworked and it is one of my top priorities to take a look at that. Um, as far as some key policy things, we need to protect mental health funding and increase services, particularly in substance abuse treatment. And uh, Senator jo Joanne Janal touched on this, but uh, I feel very strongly that we need to end subminimum wage employment. People with intellectual and developmental disabilities work just as hard as everyone else, and they should be paid that way. Um, and I think that we're not protecting people's human rights when we can pay somebody sometimes less than a dollar an hour for the same work. Um, some other points, I'm down to 30 seconds, increase funding for respite services, um, I think is a huge issue across Larimer County and across Colorado generally, um, for caregivers to be able to have the break that they need. And, and sometimes for um, those that are caring for, sometimes deserve that break too, um, from seeing the same people every day. Um, and more inclusive learning environments, I feel so strongly about my mother-in-law is a kindergarten teacher who has really pushed for this and she has her special ed specialty. And um, we, she has shared with me so many stories we don't have time for about uh, the benefit of having these different ways of thinking in a classroom. And I think we just need to value people with disabilities more in society. Thank you very much, Yara. We'll go over to Mike Lynch. Go ahead, Mike. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm reflecting on some of the conversations that I was having yesterday. Uh, we, we've, we've got a, a bunch of things that we can and should do, but unfortunately we've got a budget that is not going to be very healthy this, this coming year um, to, to, to put money towards these sort of things. So we've got to figure out how to be smart with, with how we, we deal with these issues that require funding, but uh, if the funding's not there, how do, we, how do we deal with it? And I think the answer to that is uh, working to strengthen private-public partnerships, very similar to what I was talking about earlier with, uh, with the Oxford House, with some of these transitioning units, mainly talking about people with addiction issues and trying to get them back into, uh, into being um, you know, functioning uh, citizens. Um, 
the, the other the other thing that's challenging with these issues is that uh, as a legislator you create state law however uh, a lot of times that doesn't apply to different counties so it, it's there, there's a big challenge in, in in making sure that if you come up with a policy that is to be applied throughout the state how does that work in the different counties that have different needs rather they're rural or I mean or, or, or more urban I mean a, an answer for for helping out uh, people living in Denver is substantially different than helping people out that live in Wellington. We've got uh, different resources available and different, uh, different needs uh, in those different communities. But, um, you know, back to the, back to the question we, we, as a legislator, you need to make sure that all human rights are always uh, respected and make sure that we can um, not forget about these people that are often, often forgotten in our society. And, and do what we can to help them out. And, and I think probably the best way to do that is to figure out creative ways, uh, once again, without any budget, to, um, to, to help these different local county organizations in um, completing their, their mission of, of, of helping these folks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, we'll now move over to our candidates for county commissioner, and we'll start off with our district three candidate, uh, Jody Shattuck McNally. Go ahead, Jody. Good morning. Thank you for this important question. I believe the role of county commissioner is to be a regional leader and convener um, of these for these issues and lead by example. Um, you know, to bring everyone, all the stakeholders, agencies, individuals together and make sure that we're listening, um, making sure the policies are inclusive, make sure our budgets are appropriate to help provide those resources because the county provides a lot of resources um, to individuals and to these agencies deliver, delivering these services. And so I think that we need to stay connected, um, have these stakeholder outreaches and listen to the agencies and the individuals and families receiving these services. I understand the needs and make sure that all barriers and um, challenges that are out there in the community that we address those and do what we can to help um, eliminate those barriers and make sure that um, we're listening to those needs. Um, with budgets and grant programs, there's a lot of things the county um, passes through for federal funds and things like that as well. And we can do things with the mental health initiative, the behavioral health initiative, uh, making sure that the grant money that comes through those programs is spread out throughout the whole county and make sure that we're having specific grants go out to address um, individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, they are having um, mental health or behavioral health issues as well as those with behavioral health and make sure that we are looking at our parks and our um, infrastructure and our open spaces and all of our uh, departments and buildings that make sure that they are accessible, um, that they are meeting the needs of those that we're delivering services and make sure that we are planning forward and being proactive even with our hiring um, and our policy making and making sure that reflects um, our what we want to be as leaders in the community and including everyone in those human rights and making sure everyone is deeded, treated with dignity and respect and has the same access and human rights. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jody. Uh, we'll now switch over to the candidates for County Commissioner in District 2. We'll start with Bob McCluskey this time. Go Great. ahead, Bob. Thank you, Ann. Um, it's a very important issue. Uh, the county has a very strong human services department and, and works on these issues very well. But beyond the county, it's important the county becomes a leader in uh, developing partnerships in the community. Uh, as I found when I was on the Community Foundation Board, if you have a larger view of what's going on in the county, what the needs are, and a way to look for the gaps in the services that are out there. A lot of times individual providers will look at what they're doing and probably doing it very well. I think it'd be our role to, to be able to step above that and say, okay, with the needs we see in the county, are they being met by the county and by the other partners we'll have? Or do we need to find a gap there? I think coming out of the, the COVID crisis, a lot of the funding for nonprofits uh, will be an issue. One of the issue, one of the things, approaches I've seen in the past is again, taking a look at, at providers that maybe are doing the same thing. But if their funding is on hard times because of the current environment, maybe have discussions about coming together, working together on something to make sure those services are still provided 
on one instead of maybe two organizations. I think coming out of this, we're going to find much greater needs uh, in the areas that we're talking about today, addiction, mental health, disabilities, as we've seen with veterans, with that isolation, I think there's more issues there than we're aware of. When we were dealing with problems before, and, and there was plenty to deal with before, I think they're even greater now. Once we open up, and that's an additional reason, I think, to open up more, is we'll see those and we'll be able to start working on them. Whereas now, I think when they're isolated, a lot of is going on we're not aware of that we need to deal with. I'm Bob McCleskey. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And to wrap up our prepared questions, we'll turn the microphone over to Kristen Stevens. Yeah. Thank you. So this is what it is to be a down ballot candidate <laughs> if you go last. Um, so I've uh, a lot of the work that I've done at city council level has been around transportation. So. Um, you know, we, we listened to the people and we uh, made sure that we had Sunday bus service and bus service year round. The, this helped a lot of folks be able to get to jobs and get to um, houses of worship and be able to run their errands and get to doctor's appointments. So, um, you know, accessibility is really important. That's, that's a, it's a human right to be able to, um, to get to where you need to go, I believe. And so that's, that's one of the ways that I've worked on that in city council. As far as at the county level, um, you know, I think transportation still plays a role. So um, I've always fought for transit, public transit, and those dollars to come into our community. I've worked on the uh, North Front Range MPO uh, to make sure that the One Call, One Click program got in, um, put in place so that we could have people in rural areas that would have access to transportation. So I think transportation is a big role that we can play at the county level. Um, making sure that we're funding our mental health um, programs and our behavioral health center and that we get that up and running is really important as well. Um, health and human services, access to health and human services is really important um, to make sure that people are getting uh, the programs that they qualify for and have um, understand what those programs are. So those are some of the things I want to do. One of the things I want to address is that you know, I don't think we've always prioritized this at the county level. You know, we, we found $50 million for a jail, but we didn't find enough money to fund a program like Community Corrections, which actually helps people with um, uh, behavioral health and addiction issues. So I think that we may have our priorities a little bit skewed. I want to bring that back to the people. That's really important to me and to make sure that we're hearing from you. So, you know, one of the things that I'd like to know, first of all, I know we don't have enough time for your questions, so please contact me if you have questions to those folks out in the audience. But also, I wanna hear your concerns about your financial and healthcare needs, because I think that um, I, I would like to know how best to address those at the county level as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. So we've got time, I think, for one question. And again, our team behind the scenes has been gathering those, sorting through them. And um, so the question, and, and to, to give a warning, I'm gonna start from the bottom up. So Kristen, while you're down ballot, you get to be first on this one. Um, and we're gonna shrink our time to about a minute for each candidate. And I know that that's not enough for all of the great ideas you have, but we wanna be really thoughtful of time today. So here's the question. Um, many caregivers are concerned about pending funding cuts for HCBS waivers, which provide vital support and services for people with significant disabilities to live and work in the community. How would you address the pending budget shortfall? Let me read it again because that was tough for me. Many caregivers are concerned about pending funding cuts for HCBS waivers, which provide vital support and services for people with significant disabilities to live and work in the community. How would you address the pending budget shortfall? Uh, let me reset my timer. Like I said, we'll do only a minute to make sure that we can have everybody have that opportunity. And again, we'll start with Kristen, go ahead. Okay, um, thank you for this question. And I, I don't know a lot about these waivers, but, but I do know that we are fa facing budget shortfalls in so many ways. Um, one thing that we can't do is cut funding to um, folks who are vul more vulnerable in our community. And so, you know, that's, I think that we need to make space for that in our budgets and figure that out. Um, if this is a federal, uh, federal funding, you know, I'm happy to advocate for this funding um, with our federal partners. 
this is something that I've done at the city council level many times. I've advocated for more dollars to come into our community, whether those are CARES dollars or those are you know, dollars for transportation. Um, we've been effective at this city level and I, that's something I can take to the county level. I'm, I have built relationships with our federal uh, lawmakers and our state lawmakers and um, we'll, we'll prioritize funding, like I said, for vulnerable people, people who've been hit hardest by COVID and, and some of the economic downturn. So thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, Bob, same question to you. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, when you have cuts, uh, which I've seen in the city, which I've seen in the state, uh, there's ways to, uh, to develop groups that support what you want to do. Having been in Denver uh, and knowing some of the legislators still there and the people that work around the Capitol, uh, when you know how to work the system and you see a problem coming for cuts that you want to alleviate, you know where to work. Uh, anytime you have budget shortfalls, and, and certainly the state will have that this year, um, you need to be aware of cuts and where they should do them. You need to be able to develop a case to talk about why they should look at other areas. I know in the county, uh, I've always said, if we have to make reductions, you look at the core services first. That's what you need to defend. That's your basic job to start with. So if you make cuts, you make them elsewhere. But if it's coming from the state, having the ability to organize other county commissioners around the state, knowing the groups in Denver, uh, trying to alleviate those cuts. Thank you, Bob. Uh, we'll go ahead with uh, Larimer County Commissioner candidates for District 3, Jody Shattuck McNally. Go ahead, Jody. Thank you for this uh, important question. There are a lot of budget uh, shortfalls and possibilities looming on our horizon, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic. I don't know all the details of this specific waiver, but I do know I have advocated for respite uh, supports for caregivers through the Office on Aging Advisory Council, Lamar County, and through the Human Services Commission for Loveland. Um, I think that our role will be to advocate at the federal, state, and local levels to make sure um, important funding for this is um, protected and do what we can to, act to keep that in place. I think also we need to um, do what we can to look elsewhere to support those nonprofits that are supporting those individuals and families and caregivers. As being a caregiver for my father um, until he passed last year, I know that finding respite care and helping um, provide those services was really important to help kind of keep that quality of life and help provide the stress reduction and supports that caregivers need. And that's a really important um, thing for me to support. So I would be going forward to, um, to listen and do what I can to be a strong advocate and voice. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. We'll now move on to our candidates for state representative District 49 and Mike Lynch will have you go first. I'm here, I'm here, sorry about that. <laughs> um, you know, th there's no doubt that we're gonna, we're gonna have to deal with serious uh, budget constraints this year. And, and this is the time when we sit down and we go, what do we really feel the role of government is and, and where, where, do we, where do we have to lean on the government for funding? And uh, in, the, in the case with, with your issues, there's, there's a whole lot of things we can do to partner with um, organizations that may not know uh, about your your pending needs um, so I mean unfortunately we can't lean on the state this year for that money so I, I think you know education to organizations that can help that are outside of the government purview uh, could be a really um, it could be a really good thing and, and try to lean back on those sort of societal organizations that have with their generosity uh, helped out in these issues in the past. Um, I mean, we just can't make money appear from, from, from anywhere. So we've got to start getting creative. And uh, I look forward to doing that down in the legislature uh, this next year. Thank you, Mike. Yara? Yeah, thank you so much for this question. I think that for people who are trying to access state services, especially through Medicaid, um, everyone has a story of times they had to spend hours on the phone of how difficult it is to get that coverage. Um, and I believe we have a long wait list for, for this as well. So um, I appreciate you bringing this up 
because our system is not working. And so this is why earlier when I talked about we need to rework the whole system, this is a wonderful example. Um, we People will just say, lawmakers will just say, hey, our budget is not there and they'll cut it. And that's put so many families in a tough spot and they have nowhere else to turn. But look at all the money that we spend into the health insurance industry. Look at all um, the billions of dollars of profit for the people at the top of that industry. The money is there. We're just not using it in the most effective way to help people, to help caregivers, to help people who use these waivers. So um, this is why I support a reworking of the system, but I see my time's up. Thank you very much, Yara. Uh, we'll go now with uh, Kathy Kipp, State Representative, District 52. Um, thank you. Great question. You know, one of the reasons I joined the legislature was because of the inadequacy of the way we fund our state services. And actually, it's um, frankly, it's a revenue problem. And we have a lot of stuff that's stuck into our Constitution that we need to get out of our Constitution. I would highly encourage you to consider voting yes this year on Amendment B, which your Republicans and Democratic members, two thirds of your legislature, referred to the ballot so that you could, we could start untying what you know we call this fiscal thicket or Gordian knot. Um, we also have things in our constitution that we are we tried to get on the ballot this year to, for instance, create a graduated income tax so that we could have additional revenue where wealthier people pay their fair share. Um, I would encourage you not to vote this year for 116, which would reduce permanently the state income tax. These things, if we don't, if we do pass 116 and we don't pass 1B, it's going to make it worse. And please give us the resources we need to help you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, we'll move on to State Representative, District 53, Jenny Art. Thank you. Um, I'm going to um, just talk one more time about how inclusive, connected communities are strong communities. And when we provide services that people need, like the HCBS waiver, which is Medicaid, so it is federal, but we can impact that through the state by um, emphasizing and working with our federal delegation, as Kristen Stevens says. Also, um, elections really do matter, right? You know, look at the, when I talk about elections, I ask people to know their ballot and know their candidates and know what might happen if certain things occurred. Kathy already mentioned the proposition to reduce our state income tax one more time, which is a flat tax and it's regressive. Richer people will benefit more from that reduction than poor people, but the poor people will be the one who get hurt and then it will pinch the um, state general fund and we will have to make further cuts to essential services. These things are just a, it's a, it's a math equation. Uh, I don't think there's any lack of willingness to support the social programs. It's a question of bandwidth. And then it, um, unfortunately, our communities, you know, fortunately and unfortunately, reflect our values at the ballot box. So that the good news is we represent ourselves. The tough news is sometimes uh, uh, we run out of money because of certain initiatives that um, lower the common pot of money to uh, get the sort of values lived through the services that we think are important. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, Senator Joanne Janal, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Anne. Um, I uh, totally agree that, uh, you know, the caregivers HCBS waivers are extremely important. I've helped several families uh, with this issue in, in just the last year or two uh, be able to get uh, family caregivers uh, paid uh, to help uh, their children or their adults uh, with IDD. Um, and uh, I believe that uh, what this 2008 Family Caregiver Act does is basically it's an option that was created that lifts that restriction of, uh, you know, before this, it was necessary for adults with disabilities to leave their home in order to receive the services, but now they have the option um, that allows persons receiving residential services to receive those services from a place of their choice and by a person of their choice. And what better way to do it is within their own home, in their own surroundings, with their own family member uh, caring for them. 
um, and it, it quite frankly saves um, saves money in the long run but it also is very important to have that family involved with each other and there. So um, I think that this option uh, has been utilized. I will continue to fight for more monies for it. It is a very important uh, uh, caregiver act um, that we need to continue now and into the future. And the way we can do this is by making sure that um, healthcare policy and financing or Medicaid has a line item for this, as well as um, uh, CDLE, the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment, uh, uh, is aware of what's going on as far as Family Caregiver Acts go. So um, thank you for the question. It's extremely important, especially now. Thank you, Joanne. Um, for our district attorney candidates, we actually have an alternative question we'd like to pose from our audience. Um, so I'm going to read it to you and then we'll give you each about a minute to share your thoughts. Um, research shows that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and behavioral health issues are overrepresented in prison populations, leading many in our community to feel that the jails are overutilized when other options are more, hold on, uh, are, are more appropriate. Uh, this is especially true for our Black, Indigenous, and people of color in our community. What steps would you take to address this? And again, we'll give you each about a minute, and Gordon, we will start with you. Well, thanks. That's a great question. I, was, <clears throat> I didn't have a lot to say about those waivers, so I, I appreciate the DA-specific question. Um, yes, I, I agree with that. Um, there are many folks overrepresented in, in our jails and prisons. Um, often those are marginalized communities, those are BIPOC communities, those are folks with mental health issues, um, maybe those are folks with disabilities as well. <clears throat> um, we need to drastically increase our alternatives to incarceration and, and create a culture at the DA's office where those things are valued. Um, Kristen Stevens mentioned a, a few minutes ago the $75 million jail expansion and what else could have been done with that huge amount of money. Um, I agree. Um, you know, my, my opponent supports the jail expansion. Um, I opposed it because there are much better things we can be doing with that money to treat folks. Um, here in Larimer County, as with a lot of places in the nation, the jail ends up being the largest provider of mental health services and other resources. Um, that's not the community I want to live in. I want to live in a community that's using those resources to keep folks out of jail, not treat folks while they're in jail. Um, so we need to uh, have things like restorative justice programs, um, diversion programs. Um, currently, the diversion program in Larimer County is, is so small, it's almost non-existent. Some of our neighboring counties, like Boulder County, put thousands of adults through diversion programs to keep them out of jail and get them quick and impactful access to resources uh, so that we are treating problems, not just incarcerating problems. Um, that will reduce recidivism, it will reduce taxpayer dollars, and it will create a healthier and safer community. Thank you very much, Gordon. Mitch, the floor is yours. You know, the diversion program uh, in Boulder isn't addressed at mental health uh, folks. It's, it's a much broader and different kind of a program. Here in Larimer County, we have had a mental health diversion program. And I think the issues we've had with that highlight what Mike Lynch talked about, about relying on uh, the state for certain things. You know, the state cuts this waiver. There are families relying on that in order to be able to treat their folks and keep them in their homes. And, and when that is cut, that that's, has a terrible effect on people's lives. Our diversion program is a mental health diversion program. Yes, it's small because we're one of only five jurisdictions to have that as a pilot program uh, offered by the state, but the state cut funding for it as well. And so we've had to look elsewhere for funding. I think with the, our behavioral health facility coming online here in Larimer County, we're gonna be able to do a much better job because we've created those resources locally to keep mental health folks out of the system that can be kept out. You know, the reality is, is that there are folks with uh, IDD or mental health or addiction that commit some serious crimes, crimes that are going to require incarceration. And we need a facility in Larimer County that has the ability to give them treatment, to service their needs, to have the counseling programs uh, that are essential so that they can get out and be law abiding. And those are going to be a part of our new jail expansion. And this county has also supported community corrections to a great degree. We have a really robust 
pretrial services, alternative sentencing program, and so many different programs within community of corrections addressing needs of that population. Uh, we're very fortunate to live in this jurisdiction. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. So we are quickly running up against uh, our deadline or the end of our time together, but I would like to give every candidate 30 seconds simply to share a closing thought or comment or, or your final uh, pitch for, for a vote. So again, we've got 30 seconds that we will put onto the clock and, um, and we will start with our DA candidates um, at, the, at the top of the ticket. Gordon, you can go ahead and go first. Well, thanks so much for having us and thanks everyone for tuning in again uh, and drinking our, your coffee with us this morning and sharing your breakfast. Um, my name again is Gordon McLaughlin. Uh, I would be the first Democrat ever to hold this office. Uh, I am the only candidate in this race that's not backed by huge amounts of dark money um, being spent to buy this election. I'm the only candidate in this race that's going to actually bring change to Larimer County. Um, for me, these are not election year promises or things I've ignored for eight years. These are the reasons I stood up to run uh, as a career public servant. I'm looking forward to serving everyone in Larimer County. Thank you, Gordon. Mitch? Oh, you're still on mute, Mitch. I'm sorry. Restart. Mitch Murray, candidate for district attorney. I've been doing this job for many years. I look forward to working with all of you to improve what we're doing, to make sure we're doing the best job possible for all the communities in this jurisdiction. And I will point out that my opponent, uh, $30,000 of his money has come from out of state, from the East Coast. And you gotta ask yourself, why do people out there care so much about the district attorney's office race here in Larimer County? Vote for Mitch Murray, district attorney. Thank you, Mitch. We'll now move on to uh, State Senate District 14, Joanne Janal. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, ARC, Spirit Crossing, and Foothills Gateway for putting on this uh, program. Again, to get to know all of the candidates, I really appreciate it. I'm uh, Joanne Janal running again for re-election for Senate District 14, and I have worked uh, very hard in the last eight years uh, to protect persons living with disabilities, behavioral health issues, and addictions. We've passed many bills. Um, I will um, continue to reduce the wait list that we uh, continuously talk about and uh, keep fighting for monies to do that and make sure that, that people are protected from uh, not only um, physical but financial abuses that could happen to uh, folks in this case and to provide the best care and uh, make sure that uh, they have supported employment uh, services in place for persons with cognitive disabilities. But uh, this has been a passion of mine. Look at my record. Look at the number of bills that I have run for uh, uh, people with disabilities, persons with disabilities, and I think my track record holds, uh, stands true for uh, by itself, but please check out my website, joannejanal.org. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. We'll now move on. State Representative, District 53, Jenny Art. Hi, um, I'll be brief. So thank you for having me. Thank you for your advocacy and thank you for what you do via the chamber. Um, strong communities are inclusive, they're kind, they're connected. Um, I just can't stop saying that. Um, and I believe that um, with your outreach and your advocacy, because I know every single person on this call is working as hard as they can on, on all these important issues. Um, and then I just ask that you know your ballot, know your candidates and vote your values. And if you need help with the ballot, we have lots of resources. I'm having another ballot discussion on Zoom tomorrow or Thursday. Um, League of Women Voters has a really good voter's guide if you have any questions, call any of us and um, stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, State Representative, District 52, Kathy Kipp. Um, thank you. And thank you so much for having us here today. Really appreciate it. I'm just going to be real brief since we don't have much time. Um, I'm just going to give you my one-stop 
shopping area, which is kathykip.com. That's C-A-T-H-Y-K-I-P-P. I have a quick guide there for all the ballot issues. I'm recommending telling you what my you know, positions are on them and telling you why and giving you additional resources because some of those are really important to the resources that you might be able to receive. I have Zoom hours. I have driveway hours later this week, all on my website. And my time is up. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Kathy. State Representative, District 49 uh, candidate, Michael Lynch. Go ahead, Mike. Thank you everybody for getting up uh, to do an early Zoom. I, I won't stand up so you can see that I'm not wearing pants. Uh, <laughs> this, uh, Mike Lynch, running for House District 49. I have uh, lived in this district for uh, the last 20 years as a contributor by employing people, by employing people that actually uh, that, that have uh, a lot of addiction issues and, and that's a real passion of mine and I appreciate all that you guys do to help in that effort. Um, I'm a veteran, I know what it is to serve. I look forward to solving problems and working across the aisle, working with everybody to, uh, to get issues taken care of. To learn more about my campaign, please go to lynchforcolorado.com. That's lynchforcolorado.com. Thank you so much, Ann, appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Yara Zoki. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful way to start out my day. Um, I just want to make a quick note. This pandemic has brought all the issues that we've had that were just bubbling under the surface and has shown us what a big problem they are. And that's true for mental health as well. Depression, anxiety, substance abuse have all been on the rise with this pandemic. Um, and, and so I think the time is now to elect candidates that are willing to take bold action and make a difference. My campaign's all about people over profits. I'm grassroots funded and I'm in the minority in doing that. I hope you will go to my site to find out more about me and you can reach out to me directly there, Y-A-R-A-F-O-R Colorado.com. Thank you. Thank you, Yara. Our candidate for District 3, Larimer County Commission, Jody Shattuck McNally. Thank you so much to uh, the Ark of Larimer County, Gateways, um, um, Foothills Gateway, and Spirit Crossing Summit Stone for organizing this forum today. Thank you, Ann, for um, facilitating this conversation. I appreciate the opportunity to have these important conversations. I'd like to um, agree with what Yara and Jenny had said about how the pandemic has magnified the our the gaps in services and how we need to make sure those disproportionately affected are served. And, and Jenny, yes, we are very stronger being more inclusive and together. If you'd like to learn more about me and where I stand on the issues, um, jodyforlarimer.com and please vote. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. And then finally, our candidates for Larimer County Commissioner mm -hmm. District 2, Kristen Stevens. Thank you for having us this morning. Um, my name is Kristen Stevens and I will work hard for you. I'm a, a, a working mom with two jobs, so I understand a little bit about affordability issues in our community. And I know we just scratched the surface here on issues that affect you and your families, so please feel free to contact me. My website is kristenforlarimer.com. I would love to have your vote, and once again, I'll just work hard to make sure our community works for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. And Bob McCleskey, we'll have you share the last comment. Great, the last word. Uh, I'm Bob McCleskey, candidate for uh, Larimer County Commissioner, District 2. I grew up in Larimer County. I worked in Larimer County for over 30 years at Poudre Valley Creamery in Loveland City Dairy. I was elected to the City Council and to the State Legislature twice. I appreciate the work that Foothills Gateway, the Ark, and Spear Crossing are doing and having us here today. It's an important time in Larimer County. Uh, we're facing a lot of issues, the virus, fires, budget issues. It's time to have experience. I ask for your vote. My website is McCluskeyforlarimer.com. We need to keep Larimer local. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And we want to say a very special thank you to all of you for joining us, especially our candidates and elected officials, those that have joined us as participants, and a, and a extra special thank you to Spirit Crossing Clubhouse, the Ark of Larimer County, and Foothills Gateway for hosting today's event. We did record today's opportunity, so we will make that available for sharing throughout the universe. And uh, again, as 
many of you have noted in the chat, all of the candidates are expressing a great interest in continuing this conversation with you. You can learn more at their websites or through, again, our partner organizations of Spirit Crossing, the Ark of Larimer County, and Foothills Gateway. Thank you. Have a wonderful day and go out and vote.